Our Old Testament scripture this re- morning, this reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel 20, verses 12 through 17, and tells of the deep friendship that exists between Jonathan and David. Hear these words. Jonathan said to David, by the Lord, the God of Israel, when I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or on the third day, if he is well disposed towards David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But if my father intends to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away so that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as the Lord has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the faithful love of the Lord. But if I die, never cut off your faithful love from my house, even if the Lord were to cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. Thus Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord seek out the enemies of David. Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own life. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. And then from Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. Hear these words as Jesus sends out the 70 into the world. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if, anyone there, if there is anyone there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for laborers deserve to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to my feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. I was laughing a bit this morning. Um, Drew and Janie Dimmel are good friends of mine, and many of you remember Drew, and he was in broadcasting for many, many years. When they first came to Grace, he came in and, and made an appointment, came in and visited with me in the office, and he said, Nanette, I really, I really think we need to put uh, Grace's services uh, on television. That's how long ago this was. And I said, Drew, I, I love you, but no, I, I am pretty staunchly opposed to that because I want people to come to worship in person. I want them to sit beside each other and, and, and rub shoulders. I want them to greet one another and uh, eat donuts together and have coffee. And, and Drew said, no, Nanette, it won't stop any of that. In fact, it will grow that. And you know, he spent an hour trying to convince me. Uh, that we should uh, put our services uh, on television and didn't get anywhere. Um, uh, Jane, uh, uh, Janie Dimmel, I would tell you this morning that Drew is chuckling right now um, because uh, life has found a way uh, for us to use technology uh, to reach out with one another. And so it is a a blessing to be with you this morning. My name is Nanette Roberts and uh, I'm the senior pastor at Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, I may not be the most mature person on staff when I put my uh, foot down and and get pretty stubborn, but uh, I have a a wonderful set of folks who uh, work with me and are willing to uh, be patient as it takes me a while to catch on to what others kind of leap ahead to. It is good to be together today to uh, ask ourselves how it is that God continues to lead us through this Lenten journey that has suddenly become a little more intense, perhaps, than we ever might have imagined. Uh, The interesting thing is that this sermon series was planned, of course, uh, far before the season started. And this particular Sunday, uh, the the sermon title is is The Struggle is Real. Um, and so as I was uh, kind of with, along with, I'm sure, all of my clergy colleagues trying to figure out as things uh, changed so rapidly this past week of what we were going to do and how we were going to do it, 
Um, and I began to think, do, do I want to, how do I want to change my message? How do I want to change? Do I want to choose different scriptures uh, to meet the, the need of the day? And then I looked again and meditated and read and prayed and reflected and realized uh, that this is exactly uh, probably the message that we need to hear from God this morning because the struggle is real. The struggle of how we are in relationship in most difficult times, the, the struggle of how we connect with one another, uh, when it feels like the world around us is, is falling apart and we're not sure we want to be connected with anyone. And when those connections become most challenging, perhaps, is when uh, we understand that God is in the midst of them. And so we start out with the story of the friendship of, of Jonathan and David. You'll remember with me that Jonathan, Jonathan is the son of Saul. And Saul has been anointed the first king over Israel. Samuel the prophet tried to convince the people of God that they didn't need a king, uh, that God was the only king that they needed, and that as uh, God's prophet, Samuel could bring them the communication that God wanted. But the people looked around and said every other nation who is strong and, uh, and is able to do their own will, they, they have a king. And so God says to Samuel, tell the people that I will give them a king but that king is not going to be uh, what they imagine. That king will take their sons and the daughters and make them run ahead of him into battle. Uh, he, he will take your, your best fruits of your, of your labors and use them for himself. But tell them I will give them a king. And so Saul is the first uh, king anointed uh, over the people. And, and Saul is just perhaps not suited for that role. And so as uh, things begin to deteriorate, uh, David, as you'll recall, the, the writer of many of our Psalms, uh, David, who is a, a, a brother to uh, many, of, uh, uh, many of his father's and mother's sons, and, and who seems to be the one that carries with him a kind of charisma that allows him to be a leader very early. As David rises up and, and becomes strong militarily and it becomes known for his strength, it's clear that he will be the, the leader of the people. And Saul in his jealousy and in his deterioration, I think, in insecurity and anxiety, lives into his worst self rather than his best. Sometimes that happens to all of us. When, uh, when the environment around us begins to deteriorate. And we have the opportunity to step up in strength or, or to recede in, in our insecurities and our fears. Sometimes even good people of faith decide that their fears are that which are better to control them. And instead of living into our best selves and allowing God to love us into our best selves, we, we lessen into our worst and so I don't want us to judge Saul too harshly because we all have that possibility and perhaps we've seen some of those possibilities when panic begins to spread and we decide that we need everything we can possibly find to be able to survive for two weeks. <laughs> there is not any judgment around that. There is just, there is just the possibility of reflecting. To reflect on how it is that we respond in moments that call the best out of us, in moments that we have a choice to make, would we rather respond or react? And my hope is that we would choose to respond. Saul reacts to David's increasing strength and he decides that David needs not to exist in the world and, and decides that he should have David's life taken and David senses this but, but but you see, there's this friendship between David and Jonathan. A friendship that perhaps went back to their childhood, we don't really know, but you know those, those long-standing friendships, those friendships that have a, a, a deep rootedness, those friendships that you know you can count on when the chips are down, those, those friendships that are deep enough that, that you can talk with one another quite honestly. And so, as Pastor Kyle read this morning, David and Jonathan are having this earnest conversation. And David says to Jonathan, your dad wants my life. And Jonathan said, I, I, I don't think so. And David said, well, I, I believe he does. And, and, and they decide together that Jonathan will, will find out from his father uh, in, a, in a subtle way whether or not Saul uh, desires to have David's life. And imagine standing in Jonathan's shoes with his best friend on one side and his father on the other. Two leaders, one who's leading out of fear and one who's desiring to lead out of faith. And Jonathan has a decision to make. He's got loyalty to both. 
his dad is his dad. David, his best friend and heir apparent. How will he decide what God wants him to do? The, the named leaders, the defined leaders are David and Saul. But make no mistake, Jonathan is a leader in this story as well. Sometimes we don't want to be leaders, we who aren't named by position or by authority as leaders. We don't want to see ourselves as leaders of the faith. We don't think our choices, our ordinary everyday choices really make a difference. But in fact, they absolutely do, perhaps most especially in times like these. We may decide that we're of a certain age and we have a particular strength of health. And so all of this, all of this talking about a pandemic is just so much hot air. But I wonder, are we willing to think about the other? Those out there that might be at risk. Are we willing to say that the, the percentages might in fact have some truth to them? That those in certain age ranges are at higher risk of this virus becoming serious even unto death. And are, are we going to choose to not care? Jonathan says to David, Here, here's what I will do. I'll find out from my father if he really truly wants your life. And, and then I'll come back here and, and you stay hidden. And if I shoot an arrow and it, it falls to the side of that rock over there. And I say to my, uh, to my armor bearer, go and retrieve the arrow that is beside the stone. Then you'll know it's okay to come. But if I shoot my arrow and it goes beyond the rock and I say to my to my armor bearer, go and find the arrow. It's gone beyond the stone. That means you need to go because my father wants your life. David has to rely on Jonathan's sincerity, on his honesty, and on his willingness to put his own, his own self um, behind the importance of what God will do through David. And so Jonathan has a meal with his father and realizes very quickly that Saul is afraid of David and wants him dead. So he follows through on his promise. Jonathan will lose his life beside his father in battle. And David will mourn both of them. Do we have that maturity of faith? Do we have that wisdom? I think it's the same spirit that Jesus sends the disciples out with this morning uh, from the gospel reading, sends the 70 out or the 72, depending on the interpretation that you read. He sends them out two by two. And do you know what he, do you know what he says to the disciples to do? He's, he's telling them to prepare the way for his own journey to, out to these villages and these towns. And, and he says to them, when you reach a place, say first, peace be unto this house. How hard is that to do? I, I try to remember, frankly, to do that when I'm going to visit anyone, whether they're close friends or, or, or a member of the church or, or to go to a, a conference or somewhere else. Before I enter the threshold of a place that I go, I try to say, peace be unto this place. Because what easier and more simple blessing is there to offer? We need not to take that blessing for granted. We need not to think that it's so simple that it doesn't make any difference. Peace be unto this place. It's the instruction Jesus gives. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we can do and that's one of my challenges for this day as we come out of this worship service. Maybe from where we are, we pray peace for the houses around us. Peace for the houses of those who are social distancing and feeling isolated and alone. Peace be unto the houses of worship that are choosing to meet together and some who are suspending their in-person worship. Maybe we pray peace unto the doors and the thresholds of our medical facilities. Maybe we pray peace for the homes of the doctors and nurses who are, who are right in the middle of all of this. Maybe we pray peace for our cities who are making their best decisions, for our school districts making their best decisions. Maybe we pray peace instead of, instead of react in anger no matter what we personally think about the decisions being made to try to protect us. Maybe we pray for peace in our hearts. 
It seems maybe that that's what Jesus knows that these disciples being sent out need to have because Jesus says, uh, pray there be peace in that house and if it If it isn't accepted, know that that peace will return to you. Well, for something to return to you, you have to have it in the first place. So maybe if we're going to live our our faith, maybe this time that we're invited to stay home more than we go out, maybe it's a time to work on peace in our hearts. Because most of the time we can fill our time with all kinds of other things, with activities and sporting events and school and shopping and all the things that you might imagine what would what would it be like if we decided let's sit here for a moment and understand what peace might mean for our lives might growing peace and asking God to grow peace within our spirits and our hearts mean that when events happen that we don't expect instead of reacting with knee jerk we might learn to respond more slowly and with more patience. If that peace is going to return to them, they have to have it in the first place. If peace is going to be our way of life, we have to have peace within us already. So peace is the first thing that Jesus wants these disciples to take out in their mission. A peace that Paul will say will pass all understanding. A peace that will rest and abide in us and with us and through us no matter what is happening outside of us. Do we desire that deep peace and might it be that we now have time to cultivate it? Don't you just love it when your pastor spins things to try to be positive? I'm not going to stop, you know. Because I think God is in all things. Not causing them, but I think God is in all things. How long has it been since you or I have had a few moments to cultivate deep peace? The kind of peace that Jonathan had to go to his father and to allow himself to hear his father wish ill will on his best friend and not react in the immediacy of it and say, well, I'm going to protect David in spite of you. No, that's not what Jonathan does. Jonathan simply listens to what his father says, protects his friend, and then dies in battle beside his father. There is a spiritual maturity to that. One might even say a deep peace that no matter what happens, a knowledge that God is good and God wants good for each one of us. The second thing that Jesus wants these disciples evidently to offer as they go is the kingdom of God. Because Jesus says, no matter how they receive you, if they receive you well and good and peace will rest upon them, if they don't receive you, and this is the part we all remember, right? When, when, our, friends, uh, when our friends disappoint us, we say, I'm shaking the dust from my feet and I'm leaving this place. Well, that's not really the crux of the story, even for those who don't receive these disciples. Shake the dust from your feet, Jesus says, and say, yet the kingdom of God has come near. You see, the nearness of the kingdom of God does not depend on how well it is received or how much it is rejected. The kingdom of God has come near is a truth. It is a a fact. It It is an essential. It is that thing which no one can do anything about. God's love and grace is real whether we accept it or not. We might say as human beings, if they aren't going to accept us, then a pox upon them. If, if, if they aren't going to accept us, then, then we will wish fleas in their armpits. If they're not going to accept us, then we're going to pray that God might bring bad things upon them. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, yet say to them, the end of verse 11, the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus doesn't say, now, make an assessment of the house before you enter it. Jesus doesn't say, decide whether or not they're likely to receive you. Jesus doesn't say, and if they don't receive you, bring judgment upon them. Jesus says, when you go there, pray for peace for that house. And when you leave there, tell them the kingdom of God has come near. That's yet true today. (laughs) 
that peace is available today. The kingdom of God is near to us today. And the question is the same for us as it was for the disciples, as it was for Jonathan. Are we willing to share that peace wherever it is we go? Are we willing to share it within our homes? Are we willing to share it in our neighborhoods? Are we willing to find out if our neighbors, especially if they are in older generations and afraid to go out, are we willing to sack up some of our goods and leave it on their front porch? Because we have more than enough? Because we got afraid and reacted and went and cleaned out everything that the stores had and they couldn't? Are, are we willing to share? Might that bring deeper peace in our hearts? Might it remind us who we are as God's faithful children? Might it, might it give us the understanding in a very physical and concrete way that the kingdom of God is near if we sack up some of our goods and we take them to the center of grace? For people there who may be struggling with dif differing mental or emotional abilities or disabilities and they don't have the resources or the understanding of what it is that they might need to purchase to keep them safe. Maybe, maybe we're able to give of what we have rather than react in fear. Saul chooses to live in fear and he'll die by his own hand. Jonathan chooses to live in faith and he'll, dis he'll die loyal to his father and protecting his best friend. Isn't there a depth to that? A kind of, a kind of faith that we, we want to grow into and, and we desire to have. So my challenge for this week is, is first to wish peace on the houses of those around you in our city, in our community, in our nation, and in our world. My second challenge is to pray that the kingdom of God and acknowledgement has come near and to find ways to live that out safely, but to live that out with a kind of assurance of the greatness of God that does indeed surround us. So may it be. Amen.